design may appear to be an unlikely field for studying the entangled cultural relationship between Britain and Germany in the first decades of the 20th century. It is, however, less surprising if we consider that all toys reflect and interpret the social, moral, and technical temper of their times. Furthermore, childhood and play acquired increasing importance toward the end of the 19th century and during the first half of the 20th, to the extent that the latter was, has been termed the century of the child. Building blocks. I examine in particular technical toys such as construction sets, which are inspired by the architectural and technological environment. I will present, present work in progress from a research project entitled How They Play, Children and Construction Toys, circa 1840 to 1940, a project which is funded by the DFG, the German Research Foundation. I study technical toys in the context of major changes in their respective societies especially in relation to processes of modernization. Additionally, I, situated, I situate the study of technical toys within a larger design discourse, looking at the national significance of design at the period when two world wars shattered pre-existing certainties and ushered the desire for redefining social and cultural practices. Construction sets existed before the middle of the 19th century, but became more intensely commercialized after that, in a period of increasing mechanization, when the impact of the mechanical and civil engineering on society was visible and powerfully felt in everyday life. In Germany, industrialization was relatively belated, but took an explosive character in the third quarter of the 19th century. Both Britain and Germany shared the fascination with technology, especially from around 1890 till the Second World War. The range and depth of technological transformations was such that many observers considered the new artifacts as wonders and miraculous objects. An obsession for technological modernity swept both countries and entailed various, often ambivalent or contradictory aspects, ranging from euphoria to technophobia. According to historian, historian Bernhard Rieger, Britain and Germany are particularly suited to a comparative study of attitudes towards technology since each country regarded the other as a technological competitor. The bourgeois family was struggling to cope with new roles set by modernity and with the challenges resulting from an increased concern about child rearing. In this context, the choice of appropriate toys became a significant matter. Technical toys became the quintessential middle-class playthings and were crucial as vehicles for preparing the younger generation for the future. Additionally, toys as objects of commercial competition among nations became yet another area in which the antagonistic relationship between Britain and Germany unfolded, directly influencing parents and children. Children issues were co-opted in national and international politics. Historian Hugh Cunningham notes that some political parties in Britain during the interwar period included childhood topics high in their political agendas, not just as a matter of domestic politics, but in the context of international state rivalries. He claims that children were seen as the most valuable asset the nation had, one which, if not properly nurtured, would lead to a process of degeneration and to a loss of power and status relative to other countries. Already before the First World War, commercial rivalry was evident in the business of war-related toys. UK toy producers were claiming lower prices and higher quality compared to German competitors. They would also use legends such as made by British label or produced entirely by British label on their products. Although Germany was the world's largest toy producer and German firms had a high profile in the distrib distribution of toys in Britain, social historian Kenneth Brown questions the perception widely held by contemporaries and perpetuated ever since that the toys of Edwardian, ch Edwardian children were almost exclusively German in origin. And he argues that the reality was rather more complex. According to Brown, German preeminence in the British toy market before the First World War was deliberately exaggerated by some contemporaries for political reasons, pandering to a public increasingly paranoid about the strategic threat thought to be posed to Britain by the rapid and spectacular expansion of the German economy. In the subfield of construction of building toys, the German firm Anke and Richter did indeed have global market dominance as well as a large share of the British market. 
The Angelista blogs established through high quality and successful marketing were by far the most popular of all the brand name toys before the First World War, having both international distribution and a worldwide reputation for quality and educational merit. Their design reflected German architecture of the period, mainly 1870s Baroque. The Angler blocks were patented in numerous countries and their accompanying instruction booklets were translated into 21 languages. Anchor promotional material for the, English, for the British market was published in English language and included numerous testimonials by the press or by users, typically parents. The royal family acquired these toys for their children. Such blocks were also used to make replica <coughs> copies of the Tower Bridge when it opened in 1894. The death of Adolf Richter, the driving force behind the product in 1910 and the First World War that followed, brought an end to the dominance of the company. The retreat of Anka paved the way to competitors and reinforces the image of a more balanced toy market in Britain. One of the products that acquired a share in the market was the Meccano system of metal parts, invented and introduced in 1902 by Frank Hornby of Liverpool, to support the belief that children, especially boys, should understand basic mechanics and engineering. German firms such as Merlin and Stabil imitated the highly popular Meccano and introduced their own ranges of metal construction toys. The outbreak of the First World War caused a predictable surge in the production of war-related toys. Additionally, the upset created by the war affected the toy market in many ways and opened new opportunities. The British Board of Trade identified toy making as one of several industries that could benefit from the absence of German competition. By 1916, it was claimed that around 1,500 toy lines previously manufactured in Germany were being made by British firms. Water production was, however, of inferior quality due to rising prices, restricted supplies of raw materials and shortages of skilled labour. Immediately after the First World War, Britain was again opened to toy imports, although German toys initially encountered consumer resistance. Additionally, the German toy industry was slow to recover in the 1920s because of political instability, strikes, scarcity of raw materials and hyperinflation. In the 1930s, it was further weakened as a number of prominent Jewish toy makers fled abroad to escape the Nazi regime. The influx of manufacturers from Germany to Britain as refugees enhanced pre-existing connections and collaborations. Close communication, Various exchanges and mutual influences were the norm between the two countries throughout the period under consideration. A case in point is provided by Northampton toy manufacturer Wenham Bassett Locke, a key personality for the development of British German relations in design and production. In 1900, he visited the Paris World's Fair, where he was impressed by the design and high standards of several German toy producers. He was particularly attracted by the firms George Carrette and C and Big Brothers, both of Nuremberg, and established collaborations with them for the supply of locomotives and other toy train components, produced to his specifications and to a standard of pre precision which had not been achieved in Britain. In the first decades of the 20th century, he visited Nuremberg regularly to import engines and components through his German business associates and friends such as Stefan Bing. Already before 1914, he had made contact with members of the Deutsche Werkbund, an organization founded in Munich in 1907 by a group of manufacturers and designers with the, with the aim of bringing together producers, retailers, and designers in order to improve the quality of German goods marketed in both the home and export market. The impact of the reformist activities of the Werkbund was felt in Britain especially following the Cologne Bedford Exhibition of 1914, and in spite of the establishment in Britain of the Design and Industries Association in 1915. Bassett Loke, as an early and active member of the Design and Industries Association, traveled regularly on the continent, organizing their annual tour. Being well aware of progressive approaches to design, he was a key actor in the network that linked German engineering and toy production to the Midlands. Additionally, in the mid-20s, Bassett Loeb commissioned Peter Behrens, the pioneering German architect, to design his house in Northampton, 
which was completed in 1926 and was christened New Ways. Years later, when in the 1930s German toy producers needed to evacuate from the Nazi regime, they looked to the British connections. Franz Bing and Stefan Kahn joined Bassett Lowe, for whom they had been manufacturing train sets. There is further evidence of a German, especially Jewish, diaspora having an effect on the trade locally. <coughs> the family of W.F. Graham turned from British German toy trade to children's book publishing in Northampton, while Philip Ullmann, who owned a toy factory in London, was aided by retailers Max and Spencer to leave Germany. Philip Ullman and Arthur Katz eventually established the toy company Met Toy in Northampton in 1933. Much has been written about the influence of emigres on aesthetic or cultural aspects of design, but apparently they also had a strong impact on the level of manufacturing and production. Despite his international connections, Bassett Locke himself intended to replace continental goods in his own production when public revulsion towards German-made goods grew during the First World War, and there was much talk about them being replaced by locally made ones. After the outbreak of the First World War, the British government severed all trading links with Germany and encouraged the home manufacture of goods no longer obtainable as a result. Those children lucky enough to possess commercially produced toys would quickly notice the difference, as Germany was the main source of these toys. The unavailability of German-made products from 1914 onwards encouraged British, British firms such as Wenembrey, Tomato and Lotz. The conflict lasted longer than had been anticipated, but after 1918, Bing were able to start supplying Bassett Lowe again. Nevertheless, for several years there was a bitter anti-German feeling and resistance to buying German products. There was public pressure for imported goods to be marked with a country of origin and relevant legislation was passed. As far as Bassett Lowe was concerned, his German-made goods were sold away from their boxes or else the mark was removed from the box. Traditionalist and nationalist themes are evident in the design and promotion of material of various toys throughout the period under consideration. While anchor blocks were devised for constructing German side buildings, the build of country cottages of approximately 1913, could not be more English in appeal. Mm -hmm. Sanders' Tudor stone building blocks of 1913 consist of plaster composition bricks in a medieval European style, attempting to attract British buyers through, through the Tudor label. In a similar vein, medieval knights coexist <laughs> with modern weapons <laughs> in early 20th century anchor manuals. Gradually, in the interwar years, nation-inspired labels or themes became more and more visible and therefore significant. The message All British is printed on the box of a construction set by the firm Archirecto in the early 30s, while interwar political <coughs> toys also emphasized British manufacture on their packaging. The cover of my Canada magazine of May 1940 depicts an air fight in which a German military aircraft is hit by the British one. In the same vein, Nazi insignia appear on illustrations in the manuals of Merklin metal construction sets of the 1930s. Such examples illustrate that in toy design, like in other domains, both countries incorporated a mixture of traditionalist and modern symbols under a nationalist umbrella. Following Regan's analysis, I see the area of technical toys as an eloquent example of the ambivalence towards modernity experienced in both Britain and Germany. British manufactured dot sprigs were also a side effect of the competition between the two countries. The idea came to Ernest Lott as he observed his children playing with anchor blocks and he became convinced there would be a market for a simpler English style version. He started experimenting and the results of his effort were unveiled at the 1970 British Industries Fair, itself a wartime initiative. A trade journal at the time argued, I quote, we think this line, which is of British manufacture, will prove itself to be a far better thing than anything later evolved. Our readers are very, very familiar with the German production and know what extremely crude and unsightly buildings they made, end quote. Of course, the quality of Akira products was indisputable and cherished by many British clients. 
so the aforementioned statement was far from the truth. In fact, it appears that Lot's bricks were inspired by an outdoor exhibit from the Brighton Toy and Modern Museum's display of building toys. Despite Lot's bricks being a direct imitation of Anker products, at the same time they attempted to supplant them by consciously and intensely exploiting nationalist feelings. A Lot's bricks manual around 1920 presented the plaything in these words, quote, Lot's bricks go farther than the supply of a long felt want. They open up possibilities of interest and amusement, far surpassing those of other toys. Their attractions appeal, appeal hardly less to the grown-up than to the child. They are English through and through, in material, in manufacture, in design, and in the distinctively English character of the buildings they illustrate. Lot's bricks are made for English children in an English factory by English women, and they appeal to the Englishman's ingrained belief that it is the best alone which is good enough for him. <laughs> Lot's bricks have been designed by architect Arnold Mitchell, a successful mid-market country house architect, who draw from a range of styles, including arts and crafts, and different variations of classicism. Following his success in the home market, he had also turned his attention to international opportunities before the First World War, working, working in Potsdam, which was the seat of the Prussian court at the time. Ernest Lott himself selected Mitchell as an established local arts and crafts architect with the necessary Englishness for the specific task of designing an English version of Amber blocks for children. It is ironic that German architect Hermann Mutesius appreciated the work of Arnold Mitchell and had included him in his publication Das Englische Haus, the English House of 1904, as one of the most significant British architects. Mutesius was a Prussian senior civil servant and commentator <coughs> on architecture and industrial culture. As a cultural attaché in the German embassy in London between 1896 and 1904, he was influenced by British design and became one of the pioneers of design reform in Germany, not least as one of the founding members of the Deutsche Werkbund. British-German exchanges continued on a more general level of design in the complicated circumstances of the post-World War II period when design issues were often considered to be matters of national importance. Recent research by Anne Sutro has demonstrated that German industrial design was examined systematically through a secret government mission organized by the British Intelligence Objective Subcommittee, BIOS, between July and December 1946. In this, in this initiative, nine British design experts traveled in Germany for six months visiting firms and training institutions of various consumer goods, industries in the Western zone of occupation. A few months later, the Bios Group organized a traveling exhibition entitled What Can Britain Learn from German Industry? Showcasing the insights and industrial products captured from Germany. This exhibition was organized simultaneously with the national exhibition Britain Can Make It at the Victoria and Albert Museum in the autumn of 1946 an exposi exposition of British industrial design intended to popularize questions of product design and raise design awareness among, among consumers and companies alike. One high-ranking member of the design mission to Germany and leading author of the bias report was a German immigrant, Nikolaus Tessner, an art historian who had been deprived of his post at the University of Göttingen for anti-Semitic reasons <coughs> in 1933 when he emigrated to England and gradually became one of the leading academic authorities on architectural and design, in, and design history. As most of you know, his book Pioneers of the Modern Movement, first published in 1936, and the second edition as Pioneers of Modern Design in 1949, and then revised and partly rewritten in 1960, has had an enduring influence on the history of architecture and design. Although it might appear from the bias activities that knowledge transfer was one-sided from Germany to Britain, in fact, transfer in the opposite direction was also evident. West Germany imitated a number of British solutions related to design reform in industry. One characteristic example is the founding of the German Design Council, which was based on the Council of Industrial Design in Great Britain, an organization which elevated industrial design to a matter of national concern. The significance of establishing a national design council was highlighted by Elsa Meissner, a long-time Berkman member and activist in the Weimar women's movement, in a text published in 1950. 
Meissner situated German design within the larger cultural geography of international design and emphasized that even Great Britain has established a generously subsidized concept of industrial design in 1944 with the exclusive aim of promoting British industrial design at home and abroad. The English word design itself entered the German language in the post-war period when it became adopted as part of a recognized international terminology. To conclude, it is evidence from the examples presented that during the first half of the 20th century, British-German relations in the field of technical toys were operating on a multitude of levels. Toy design and production were embedded in wider socio-political contexts and permeated by larger debates. They were shaped by the social, cultural and political milieu, but also helped shape it. The emerging view is one of multidimensional exchanges, mutual influences and ongoing cross-fertilization. Historical research illuminates these complicated and nuanced situations, a process that may pro prove useful today in helping us avoid simplistic answers to complex questions. Thank you for your attention.